Hello, this is Brian Rowe with Mythic MTG Tech number 24. Today we're going to be looking at a deck that I played last night in a local legacy tournament here in Seattle at Card Kingdom. This is called Mini Pox. This is a hardcore homebrew deck. This is something that myself and Marguerite Cottrell have been working on for a significant period of time. It's well before Ravnica came out and it is so good feeling to play a homebrew deck in a legacy event. Uh, here's the deck list that I finally settled on last night. Uh, I do want to point out that the sideboard was finished at the absolute last second and could use some improvements, uh, but we're going to take some time and look at this deck list a little bit more in depth. The main idea behind this deck is to gain massive card advantage while also destroying your opponent's land. Uh, small pox in here is just incredible. It's off and a three for one sinkhole works really well and pox itself is amazing um, although we're down to two copies in this current pox deck many traditional pox decks run four and i'm going to talk about that in a second let's look at pox first pox has got a little bit of math to it and the wording on it is a little bit long i had most of my opponents actually read this card more than once to make sure that it did what it said it did i'm surprised nobody called over the judge for the oracle text because the oracle text is even slightly different um, but each player loses a third of his life then chooses a third of cards to discard then sacrifices a third of creatures and sacrifices a third of the lands they control rounding each up now this is very important this rounding each up is something you've got to pay a lot of attention to and this is what i refer to as the secret of four if your opponent has two land and you play this they're only going to lose one but if they have four land they're going to lose two this can be devastating same thing is true of number of cards in hand so while you're playing pox you have to be very careful to have the right number of cards in play and the right number of cards in hand in order to maximize the impact on your opponent and minimize the impact on you the first time you play this card you will often get several two for ones uh, out of it several extra cards because your opponent will have no idea how to play around it after that if they pay attention they can try to optimize things the same way that you do but you being the one casting the spell controlling this helps a lot now that we've talked about pox the one of the cards that this deck was named after let's focus for a minute here on smallpox because smallpox i think is actually a better version of pox in most situations smallpox has each player lose one life discard one card sacrifice a creature then sacrifice a land now this card often ends up being a three for one you can cast it while you have no other cards in hand so your opponent is discarding a card and you're not or you're discarding something beneficial like life from the loam the land that you sacrifice may be a land that you pull back later with life from the loam or has some other effect that is useful when it comes into play and with a deck like this that has virtually no creatures or creatures that recur themselves the sacrificing a creature doesn't really hurt you at all uh, the one life also here is not trivial several of my games were very close and having that extra damage that comes from pox and from small pox does matter a lot uh, sinkhole is in here and this was a last minute addition uh, to the deck is to really deal with those basic lands that your opponent has often after you've wastelanded them once or twice your opponent starts to grab their basic lands thinking that they're safe and when they're actually only running one or two basic lands in the entire deck then you're able to sinkhole them when they believe that they are safe and pull ahead into your grindy control for the rest of the game the next cards we're going to look at here is the all-purpose removal suite uh, pernicious deeds is great because it's a board wipe it hits pretty much everything except lands and planeswalkers which you've got a planeswalker in here in liliana of the veil so you're able to keep your liliana although it doesn't hit jace and i did have a little bit of an issue yesterday playing against jace maelstrom pulse in there is to hit those larger permanents including jace and it is wonderful i think in looking at this deck again i may actually add another one abrupt decay is in here as a four of and i know that you're wondering at this point 
why am I playing four of Abrupt Decay? This card is just amazing. It's a wonderfully good card. This has lived up to all the expectations that I had for the card. Now, I did play against two counterbalance decks last night, so I, there was some positive interactions there. But this card really takes care of almost everything that you want in Legacy outside of combo cards. Played against Counterbalance twice last night, and Abrupt Decay is a wonderful answer to Counterbalance. There's nothing that they can do about it. Your opponent has often dropped down to no cards in hand by the time you play the Abrupt Decay because of your hand destruction, and is relying on a top and a Counterbalance to keep them in the game. This swings the game around and is the biggest change in the current metagame to make Pox a viable deck is the ability to deal with counterbalance. It also deals with Tarmogoyce and Insectile Aberrations. Both of these are incredibly strong beatdown creatures that previous to Abrupt Decay could easily be defended by Force of Will, Stifles, and Dazes. Abrupt Decay wipes them out and gets you into a situation where you're going to just be able to take over the game. It also hits Stoneforge Mystic. Now this may seem a little bit odd, but with the large amount of land destruction and creature destruction in this deck, even if a Stoneforge resolves, they often don't have the mana to put out the Batter Skull or return the Batter Skull later if you are able to deal with the Stoneforge Mystic. So Abrupt Decay is really nice for even hitting Stoneforge. It also has a lot of utility that I didn't realize until playing it last night. Uh, I used it several times on people's Mishra's factories when my wastelands weren't available. I also used it on Ly Alliance Eye Diamond when an opponent was trying to uh, play Storm. They were trying to get around my hand destruction by putting out their permanents. Being able to destroy their permanents mattered a lot. I also used it on a germ token more than once with regards to a batter skull being in play to get through my last few points of damage or to neutralize their batter skull entirely because they didn't have the land to recast it. It's also just a great answer to Liliana the Veil if your opponent happens to get that out first, although Lily really doesn't affect you that much. The next area that we're looking at here is the targeted hand destruction. This is one of the things that's so appealing about this deck is that it does actually play really well against combo decks because you have so much hand destruction early on. The Thought Seizes are wonderful. They hit pretty much everything out there. The Inquisition is almost as good and doesn't cost you two life, so it's better against your burn or hyper-aggressive decks. And him to Turok can often hit lands early on, so it adds into the land destruction theme. My all-stars, though, were really the Sinkholes, Liliana, and Life from the Loam. Let's first start with Liliana. After you've ripped out your opponent's cards from their hand, it doesn't seem like Liliana would be that good. Liliana is also a form of land destruction in her ultimate, allowing you to divide up the remaining permanents that they have. There's not a lot of answers to general permanents in this deck, so she works really well there. The ability to get your opponent to sacrifice creatures means that a Liliana that's been out for a few turns is extremely difficult for your opponent to deal with. Uh, she was a wonderful card in this deck. I'm very happy to have her as a four of. Uh, Sinkhole was really good here, getting around the basics lands, as I talked about earlier. But the MVP was really life from the loan. Many of the decks that I played last night, outside of the Storm deck that I played against, were slower control decks. And these control decks could not keep up with the card advantage that life from the loam and Baron Moore created along with reoccurring wastelands or Mishra's factories. Wonderfully powerful card, loved having it as a two up in the deck. The land base here is a little bit interesting. We've got the utility lands here. The Urborg is to turn everything into black because you definitely need black sources. The, the fetch lands here, obviously, all of them allow you to go get by you. I'm probably playing a little bit light on the basic lands. When moving from Marguerite's deck list to my deck list, I added two bayous and cut down some basic lands. In retrospect, that may have been a mistake. I may only want three bayous in here or two because basic lands are extremely important for you against your opponent's wastelands overall. And black is really what you need. There's a minimal amount of green that you need in this deck. And between the fetches and 
a single source or two of green in play, you're often in great shape. Green conditions in this deck are a little bit sparse. I'm running on Nether Spirit, four Mishra Factories, and two Curse Scrolls. Curse Scroll actually also doubles as creature removal in some cases. Uh, the deck is very grindy in its current build, and I would consider putting in one bigger win condition also on a redesign. I'll talk about that towards the end of this video. Also threw in a Nile Spell Bomb as a piece of tech here, hoping to deal with competing bug decks or Rug Delver, two of the mo po more popular decks in Legacy right now. I was not especially happy with this piece of tech. I'm actually going to look at things to replace it with. It was a good idea, but it just didn't fit into the control metagame that I ran into here in Seattle. My sideboard was honestly thrown together at the absolute last minute. I had put together an elegant sideboard, put it into my cart, attempted to check out with it, and apparently screwed up somehow, finding out that I never processed the order. So at the last second, I threw this sideboard together, and I was actually pretty happy with it if I had seen elves or creatures or goblins of some type. Uh, it was a little weak against the control decks that I ended up playing against. The Kosin Grip was incredibly useful, but the Tabernacle, the Parishes, and the Engineer Plagues were not that good. Engineer's Plague would have been really good if I had seen Lingering Souls, which was one of the things I really feared, because Discard doesn't work well on Lingering Souls, neither does the Creature Removal that I have. Uh, Leyline of the Void is very good for the dredge matchup and the dredge matchup is actually pretty rough first game so you really need a lot of removal and looking at redoing this sideboard there's several options out there but I'll get to that at the end i need to give credit where credit is due uh, marguerite or maggie dear on tapped out is who i've been working with this deck on since well before ravnica came out um, once we saw the Abrupt Decays, though, we knew that this deck would end up being viable. Um, parallel to that development, Reed Duke um, has been working on Pox decks for a significant period of time, which I ran into in my research. Uh, my deck is actually pretty close to the one that he put forward on Star City Games recently. I, this is one of the best builds out there. I had missed his tech, uh, Worm Harvest, which I think could be very incredible. Uh, I recommend checking out this article over at Star City Games. Improvements that I really made above and beyond both Marguerite's and Reed's deck was to get rid of Dark Ritual. Dark Ritual is one of, one of the weakest cards in both of those builds. An environment with Daze, Spell Pierce, and Force of Will, you're setting yourself up to get two for one, and you're often not able to cast what you wanted to off of the Dark Ritual. By taking a slightly slower path, you end up with a lot of card advantage. In this build, when moving from Marguerite's build to my build, I added the Sinkholes and the Thought Seizes, which were ideas that were also in Reed's build, and they worked extremely well. I also added a basic Forest, which was not in uh, Reed's additional build, and having that basic land mattered in two games specifically, where I was playing against Wastelands. Very, very valuable to have a basic Forest, because you must have Abrupt Decay in many situations run through the four quick rounds that I played. First round I played against a bug control deck. This was a pretty original build, although it did take some of the tech from last week's Star City Open and kind of try to capitalize on it. My only issue was dealing with Jace the Mind Sculptor. Uh, once he is out, he's very difficult for this deck to deal with, although Life from the Loam on my side did give me a really strong uh, card advantage to work with. Uh, we went all three games, and I believe that I had wrestled, wrestled control back at the end of the third game, but we ran out of time. This was a very, very close game, very, very close round, and my play mistakes definitely mattered here a lot. In round two, I played against Storm. Uh, game one, I got a strong win very quickly based on a bunch of hand destruction followed by land destruction. Game two, I made the mistake of citing out my abrupt decays and my board removal entirely, and my opponent was able to put all their permanents in play, like the Lion's Eye Diamond and Lotus Petals, and then go off in a single turn. My deck is very slow and grindy. Once I put back in some board control, I was able to destroy their lands rather easily and also remove their permanents, allowing me to grind out the win in game three. 
in the third round, I played a very, very close battle versus Countertop. In game one, we went all the way down to two life with my Mishra's not being able to break through before they were able to get off a miracle for the win. This was a counterbalance deck. In game two, I was able to come back and put some serious pressure on, but I wasn't able to close out the game fast enough to get to a draw state. I realized that I really need to learn this deck well and play it um, quickly, especially if I lose game one. The deck is grindy and may need another win condition. In round four, I played against another countertop deck. Liliana was the MVP here, and she was just incredible against a resolved counterbalance, allowing me to build up a significant number of counters, get rid of most of their land, and then continue to discard cards. Uh, the Abrupt Decays and Coasting Grip from the sideboard were also extremely important for that 2-0 win in round 4. My takeaways from this are that you need to be extremely careful about how you play. I need a giant die to put on top of my deck. There was more than once that I moved from upkeep into draw phase, missing a dredge or another trigger from the graveyard. Uh, that die needs to sit directly on top of my library. Yes, that's a crazy picture of a library down there at the bottom. That's the library I live a few blocks from. Um, and not move there until I'm reminded of what's going on during upkeep and draw to make the best choices. So I need to fine tune the sideboard a bit. If Jace is going to be prevalent in the environment, which I think he really is, Maelstrom Pulse would be a really good idea. I also need to look at things that work a little bit better with Dredge. Spinning Darkness and Dark Blast are definite options out there along with Coffin Purge or other things that I can cast from my graveyard, maybe a Raven's Crime. The sideboard could definitely be improved and I'll be working on it soon. Other changes to the deck really work around the dredge theme and also what I can do to maximize the impact of having an advantage here. I need to look towards wing conditions a little bit more closely and see how I can best utilize them. Maybe even put in some type of a package that uses the graveyard effectively with regards to Entomb. There's some pretty cool ideas out there over at Star City Games and a legacy article written about a year ago, it appears, by Reed Duke also on Pox. Thanks, this has been Brian Rowe with a mini Pox deck tech. Uh, Look forward to playing this deck and some other brand new brews in the near future. If you've got any ideas on how you can improve this deck, definitely let me know. I'm looking for them.